when uh, I was a kid, we had three schools up there that I went to. <coughs> one was the Haddon School, and one was the, what they, we called the Kiefer School, and the other one was the original Genevieve School. So. Oh, really? I think we actually got a picture of the the Keeper School as well. Was that was that? Who, I can tell you who all of those kids were. Was that Gertrude that taught there? Well, Gertrude taught one year, and there was a a Swalheim taught one uh, one year. I don't. I think just two years is all. Uh, Oh, more of that school was open there. They de decided they needed a bunch of those, bunch of those schools together. So that's what they wound up with. So, so that that Kiefer school that was right on that corner to turn to the hall, wasn't it? Yep. That was the old Kiefer hot place where the Kiefer lived. That was the old. And I don't know who those Kiefer's were. They were people that were gone before I remember. Mm. They moved that house down here where the uh, city pump is now. Oh, really? And then I think Sherman Laycock finally tore the thing down. Oh. That's the one I went to school in. What was the Genevieve school like? Was it just a one room? Pretty much, of course, this Kiefer school, that was all they used was just one room in it. There was a half a dozen rooms in it, so upstairs, and there was a basement under Those, that Genevieve school, that was... Well, all the schools we went to up there were all summer schools because it was too damn cold in the winter time to be <laughs> running around to get kids to school. So as soon as the weather got bad, well, they shut the schools down. So a little bit different than it is now. Well. You got whatever education was available, I guess. And <clears throat> when we were going to the Genevieve School, I think I was in the first grade when I started up there, and rode a horse up. Mother used to put me on the horse when I left the house and the teacher took you off when you got up to school. <laughs> <laughs> huh. And then uh, Hatton School, I think that was about four miles to that one and I think we rode a horse over there. And the Kiefer School, we had a uh, we went over there in a a buggy. We had an old buggy horse. My granddad Mogan had one anyway, and that's what we used to. One year, no, it, yeah, just one year we went to buggy, and then after that, I think we rode over. How many siblings did you have? Well, I had I had just one brother when when we were going to school at that time. The sister, she was born somewhat later. So, which school was the best? Well, that Kiefer school was because we had a lot of girls to go to school with over there. <laughs> <laughs> that 
Genevieve anyway, School, I think there was Hilda Johnson, I think, was the only girl that went up there, and she was quite a bit older than I was, so. And then that, there was a kid by the name of Cliff O'Connell, and he was, well, he was probably full, full blooded Indian, if you'd have got into his history, in a way. Hmm. And he was, he never, he never lived with any of his folks. Uh, his dad was a Jack O'Connell, and his mother was glad of something or other. But that, the Valentines, were neighbors of ours, and Mrs. Valentine, I, she might have been a full blood. The uh, old John Valentine, the dad, I think he was an Irishman, and this Mrs. Valentine, I, as I remember her, I think she. Cooked for all the goddamn grub riders in the country because there was Valentine's. There was a couple of older boys, and of course they always had friends. And they were when they'd come through, they'd always stay overnight. So <laughs> Mrs. Valentine would feed them, and they took the horse out to the barn, and you had to feed the horses. If they were going to stay overnight and water them, so now that was quite a hangout that Valentine place. Johnny Valentine was, I guess you could about said one of my best friends. He finally. He worked for Clara Duncan up there. In fact, he rode for the summer herd in that country for years. And, and he was living with Clara Duncan, I guess. But he was probably one of the nicest Native Americans I think anybody was ever lucky enough to know. <laughs> He finally moved in to Mola and he was living, living up there and any time I went to Mola I'd always tell Agnes I got to go over and visit John a few minutes before I go home and two hours later I was always still there. He was the damnedest storyteller you could imagine. <laughs> And I don't know if he ever told me to say one twice or not. If he did, he probably didn't recognize it, so. <laughs> well, a lot of those guys, I guess I shouldn't say that, were horse thieves. There was no doubt about it, but one thing those guys, if they were horse thieves, they, they never stole from the neighbors. <laughs> you probably wouldn't last very long if you stole from your neighbors. They'd probably get you well, pretty quick. If you were going to get along with them, I guess. If you stole a horse you wanted to, you didn't have a, the stolen horse next door, so you had to do something else with it. And this Johnny Valentine, as I, I was just a kid at the time, and they were about a mile from us, I guess, and he'd, he'd be going to the Missouri, which was out south here, 
And I had no idea how damn far off. I didn't know what the Missouri was, whether it was a goddamn river or a range of mountains or what it was. <laughs> it was just a name. <laughs> well, him and about three or four other people had a kind of a robber's roost down there in the Missouri. It was an area where I think they were living in a dugout, and I, I don't think there was even a decent wagon trail to get in and out of that place. A friend of mine from Malta, he had One of the guys he worked with was an old brand inspector, and uh, and he'd been down there on the on the Missouri, and he was trying to catch these guys. He knew they were eating etchart meat because they didn't have a that was all they had to eat around there, and they were. Those guys would pick up horses, say in the Canadian horses, that they'd bring through this country, and they'd take them down to this area they had, and they'd swim them across the Missouri. That was before the dam was in, and the Missouri was just a river. And as soon as you got them on the, down in the McCohen County, I guess I'd made an honest horse out of them then, so. <laughs> And then they'd steal horses down there and they'd come up and they'd go through this country and once they got them into Canada, well then I guess that made an honest horse on them up there, so. <laughs> they figured no one was crazy enough to drive them that far, huh? Well, well they weren't going to haul them because there were no trucks to haul them. Anytime anybody moved anything, they, that's the way they... You just got in behind them and, or, and trailed them. Were there any wild horses around? Well, that's a kind of a whole different story. They, somebody got smart in this country years ago and after the homesteaders had uh, starved out and a lot of those people just, uh, once they, when Fort Peck started, they got a few dollars and they left the country and they just turned their work on their saddle horses out. And they were just scattered around the goddamn country. Well, back before my time, they, somebody got smart and they decided they better get rid of all of those goddamn horses that were floating around this country. So they started at the Canadian line and they got a bunch of young punk cowboys and they'd bring those things in and they'd trail them say at Hinsdale and they'd notify people we got all of these horses in here and if you got any in there you better come and get them because Anything that isn't picked up or going, they, they were canning the things and they'd uh, ship them, I don't know where they were shipping them, someplace to can them. So that, that cleaned the country out. And you get down there in the Pryor Mountains and they never done that. They, those goddamn wild horses, in fact, they, the BLM, I think, are still feeding them stupid things down there. And uh, there's a feedlot in Lowell, Wyoming, and any of those horses they can't get rid of, that's where they wind up. Hmm. And they, they uh, got vets down there taking good care of them to be sure, they, be sure there's nothing wrong with them to keep them alive. And there's uh, only one way they can get out of there, the, they eventually get die of old age, I guess. I don't know how many horses they've got in that country, but it's of course it's a hundreds of thousands of dollars just to feed the stupid things. 
Well, we were all damn lucky in this country. Somebody was smart enough to clean this country out and get rid of them before, or else we'd have had the same mess as they got in the prior mountains. I never did know who to give credit for that. Somebody, <laughs> somebody did the smart thing. They had a bunch of them out south, and they did the same thing out there. They got a bunch of those young cowboys, and they bring them in, and they'd uh, probably bring them in to Hinsdale or, or probably Van Day or Tampico, any of those places that had a stockyard, and then they'd tell people to come if there's any of these things you want, you better come and get them. <laughs> Well, those ones that are in the prior mounds, they claim they're wild horses, but hell, there wasn't any wild horses in, in this country back then. If, if there had been, the Indians would have already picked them up and were using them for their own use. All those ones that they got down there is some stuff that was, they, well, the ranchers just turned out and kicked them out. And, to get the, there was no sale for them, so they opened up the corral gate and turned them out and let them go. So a lot of people this day and age, if they got a a horse, they don't even brand it because they, if they want to get rid of it, you can't. There's no sale for them. There's, uh, you can't legally can a horse anymore, so what in the hell are you going to do with them? They just turn them out, and, and if you don't have a brand on then nobody knows who in the hell they belong to. So. Yeah, they're treated as pets now instead of work animals. Well, they're, they're worthless as far as I'm concerned, and they... The legislature made the mistake when they got those things declared an endangered species in the first place. And when you make a mistake, it looks to me like eventually you should be able to straighten it out, but I, I guess you never can. <laughs> were there still any sheep men around when you were young? Everybody in this country started out with sheep. You go back far enough. And most of them stayed in the sheep as long as they could get decent sheep herders, but then the, that was, it finally got to the point you there wasn't enough old drunks that wanted to be sheep herders, so pretty hard to stay in the sheep business when you don't have a sheep herder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think just, there wasn't but a one or two ranchers in this country that didn't start out in the sheep business. I thought old Frank Jones, I think, was one that never was in the sheep business. Cornwells, I know, that's, they started out in the sheep business. Etcharts were sheep people. Yeah, I heard the old timers would say when the times got tough, you sold the cows and kept the sheep because you got two paychecks and they could live off nothing. Well, that's just about what it amounted to. People would get tired of fighting the young damn sheep herders and get rid of the sheep and go into the cow business. Then if they got hard up, they'd have to go back into the sheep business again. <laughs> so they'd get, get out of debt. So. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 